America's vast national parks and sprawling recreational areas are said to play host to a gallery of mysterious entities. This week we take a look at a murderous cryptid which is rumoured to reside in a region which separates the southeastern states of Tennessee and Kentucky, a place known as the Land Between the Lakes. Before we get to that though, we'd just like to take this opportunity to tell you that the second volume of our book has finally been published and is available on Amazon right now. Full disclosure, the book is pretty much just the transcripts of the episodes, so don't buy it if you're expecting something different. However, rather than a mere copy and paste job, this book should be viewed as a companion piece to the YouTube series. We've updated many of the scripts with new information, in some cases completely rewriting them, corrected factual errors, and have even included a couple of bonus chapters which were never made into episodes for the series. Elsewhere, there's a foreword from Laura Routon of the excellent Paranormal Scholar YouTube channel, and we've even taken on feedback from the reviews of our first volume and included some of our iconic imagery throughout. Oh, and just for good measure, we've also completely overhauled the first volume, giving it an extensive edit, a foreword from Top 5s, and we've adopted the same look and feel as Volume 2 for consistency. Get both on Amazon right now using the link in the description or pinned comment. Roll on Volume 3. It was in 1963 that President John F. Kennedy designated the rolling forest land, which separates Lake Barkley from neighbouring Kentucky Lake, a protected recreation area. Possessing 300 miles of shoreline and 170,000 acres of verdant woodland, the region has always been popular with hikers and holidaymakers. But ever since European settlers first ventured inside its boundaries, there have been reports of enigmatic and mysterious creatures, which dwell in amongst the trees. French hunters and trappers sometimes return from the forest, describing encounters with shadowy figures, which would mysteriously disappear when challenged. There were also reports of strange lights which hovered in the skies overhead, trailing the hunters as they made their way deeper into the woods. As relations with the native population gradually improved, it became clear that there were sections of the forests which the local Shawnee tribe refused to enter. Attempting to prevent harm from coming to the new settlers, they shared stories of a shape-shifting shaman who dwelt in the woods, one who possessed the ability to alter his form into that of a savage and carnivorous beast. Undeterred by these tales, and lured by a relatively untouched environment in which to work, the trappers pressed on with their business, regardless. But quite soon it became horrifyingly clear that there was some truth in the warnings they had failed to heed, with reports of a murderous beast stalking them as they went about their work. Word would soon begin to spread beyond Kentucky and its borders of a wolf-like entity standing nearly seven feet tall on its hind legs. As hunters were startled by mysterious howls in the night, and farmers began to find the mutilated carcasses of their livestock lying dead in their fields, the unseen terror which was responsible was given a name. The Lugaru. Witness testimony pertaining to this hulking and murderous creature has persisted. From historic reports of missing hunters and townsfolk, to far more recent alleged encounters. During the spring of 1973, a group of male students from Murray State University decided to take a trip out to the woods in a VW microbus. Travelling up along US Route 68 and out across the Egnes Ferry Bridge, they were soon deep within the land between the lakes, 
where they turned off into an isolated and remote clearing. Having foraged for dead wood and set up a fire near the van, the group then settled in for the evening, drinking beers and swapping stories. An hour or so later, one of their number rose to his feet and made his excuses, before walking off alone into the trees to answer a call of nature. The youth in question would re-emerge several minutes later, in a visibly distressed state, claiming that he had heard something snuffling and circling around him whilst he had been out in the woods. Initially laughing off their friend's claim as a prank, the students had continued with their evening. But as time wore on, several more became aware of something slowly circling the camp, hidden from sight beyond the tree line. One by one, they had each fallen silent, as the sound of snapping branches slowly progressed in a wide circle within the trees which surrounded the clearing. These noises were accompanied by what they described as a deep sniffing sound, with two of the group later claiming that they had seen a pair of glowing red eyes staring back at them out of the darkness. Suddenly, a deafening wolf-like howl sounded from nearby, which immediately prompted the youths to pile back into their transport and start the engine. But no sooner had they done so, than a tall and slender shape slammed into the back of the van. The resultant force knocked several of the students inside off their feet. As the van pulled away, the sound of shrieking and grinding metal came from the rear, as if the back end of the vehicle was caught on something. Driving straight back to their campus, the group were horrified to discover significant damage to the tail end of the vehicle, with four deep and distinct gashes gouged into the cover of the engine compartment. It was as if something with huge claws had repeatedly slashed and torn away at the metalwork. Five years later, in July of 1978, a 17-year-old girl named Jan Thompson had gone to stay at her aunt's house in Grand Rivers for a couple of weeks. The premises in question were located at the junction of several hiking trails, which headed off into the nearby forest and lay not far from the banks of the neighbouring Kentucky Lake. Thompson very much enjoyed spending her summers at the location, as it gave her the opportunity to spend time with her younger cousins, Joe and Rhonda. When her aunt and uncle would head off to work during the daytime, she would sit outside the house and keep Rhonda entertained. Thirteen-year-old Joe would usually spend the day off out in the woods on his dirt bike. But one evening, as the two girls were sat playing out on the front porch, they heard the sound of Joe's bike heading back towards them through the woods. They realised almost instantly that something was wrong. Looking into each other's eyes with growing apprehension, the pair knew that the pitch of the bike's engine was far too high, indicating that it was being ridden at a dangerous speed. Sure enough, when the trail bike and its rider emerged from the trees, it was travelling at breakneck speed, taking all of Joe's skill to bring it to a stop without falling from the saddle. After he had dismounted and began to limp across to the girls, Thompson could see what appeared to be fresh blood dripping from a long tear in the right leg of his jeans. With tears streaming down his face, her younger cousin explained how he had been heading home along a path by the old sawmill when a dark shape had burst out of the bushes and tried to grab hold of him. Feeling the pain of sharp claws slicing across his right leg, the boy had immediately accelerated away. But turning to look over his shoulder, he had then seen his attacker in pursuit, now fully upright on two legs. Thompson had been in the process of trying to calm Rhonda, he was clearly upset by the blood she could see on her brother's right leg when they were startled by a guttural roar, which had come from somewhere further down the nearby trail. A tall figure then stepped out from the tree line, its lean body barely discernible beneath the thick pelt of jet black fur, covering its entire being. As Jan and her cousins quickly moved back across the porch towards the front door, 
the creature had stepped forward and in doing so had activated a security light affixed to the side of the house. The creature had instantly halted, shielding its eyes from the glare, and in doing so, had allowed the children to flee into the address and lock the door behind them. For several seconds it remained motionless, almost contemplating the beam of blinding light. Through the windows, Jan managed to get a good look at the intruder. She would later state how it was unlike the description she had heard of Sasquatches, which apparently roamed the region. It was instead more reminiscent of a dog or wolf, and was standing upright on its hind legs. Its black eyes were almost indiscernible, somewhat lost amongst the mass of dark fur surrounding its features. As the creature then resumed its steady advance towards the house, Jan seized several knives from a drawer in the kitchen before ushering the younger children upstairs where they all hid under one of the beds. For the next hour or so, the trio were plagued by the sounds of repeated banging and clattering all around the exterior of the ground floor, culminating in the smashing of glass as a downstairs window was apparently shattered. These sounds instantly ceased when the horn blast from an approaching vehicle was heard, signalling to the children that their mother had arrived home. Minutes later, Jan's aunt had stepped in through the front door, chiding the children for not having come out to help her unpack the shopping, as she had indicated for them to do so by using the car horn. Upon seeing the haunted and terrified expressions on the faces of the three youngsters, she advised them to stay where they were, and went outside to inspect the house. It would later be discovered that one of the kitchen windows had indeed been broken inwards by the attacker. Upon his subsequent return home, Jan's uncle had listened impassively as they had related their story. Asking no questions of the account, he had simply forbidden the children from entering the woods again at any point, before sending them all off to bed. There is another story, however, with which the beast of the land between the lakes will forever be associated. A horrifying tale, allegedly covered up by the local authorities to avoid widespread panic. In 1982, so the story goes, an entire family was brutally murdered whilst camping in the region. Their motorhome was discovered stained with blood, with the bodies of the father, mother and 13-year-old son found heavily mutilated in and around the campsite, apparently having been attacked by something with huge claws. The nine-year-old daughter was later discovered some distance away, having been lodged in the high branches of a tree. There are several differing versions of this incident, passed down by local residents over the years since it was reported to have occurred. For this reason, it was largely written off by many commentators as pure fiction, due to a lack of accompanying evidence. Then, in December of 2020, an apparent eyewitness to the event finally came forward. Contacting a YouTube channel by the name of Cryptid Studies Institute, a man calling himself Roger claimed that in 1982, he had been invited to go camping with a family at a recreational site within the land between the lakes. Having had several initial conversations, the presenters were so compelled by his testimony that they invited him onto the channel for a formal interview, which is linked in the description. There are some notable differences between Roger's story and the ones which have since circulated online. For instance, he is adamant that the body of the youngest member of the family was not discovered up in a tree some distance from the camp, but was instead found where she was killed, inside the RV. The man related that at the time of the incident, he was a 15-year-old boy staying with relatives in the town of LaGrange, Indiana. During his time there, he had befriended a family of four, who had recently moved to the area, having made the decision to leave a neighbouring Amish community. In April of that year, 
he had been approached by the father of the family, a man named Levi, and was asked if he wanted to accompany them on a short camping break. Having been granted permission by his relatives, Roger then joined the group in their brand new Holiday Imperial motorhome, heading for a campsite situated somewhere in between Tennessee and Kentucky. Levi and his wife Diane had two children, nine-year-old Connie and her 13-year-old brother Stephen, both of whom were friendly with Roger. Arriving at the campsite in the early evening of April the 7th, they had found no other vehicles present. Levi had driven slowly past the simple concrete toilet blocks, before parking up at the extreme end of the campsite. It was at this point that the father and son had walked off into the adjoining forest to collect wood for a campfire. Whilst they did so, the women of the family had remained inside the camper van, preparing dinner. At something of a loose end, Roger had elected to start his holiday by target shooting some tin cans, using the 410 shotgun he had brought along with him. But as he had been collecting his would-be targets, he suddenly became aware of a disturbance coming from the front of the RV, with several male voices shouting in alarm. Running forwards to the driver's seat to see what was going on, the boy was horrified to see Stephen being attacked by a towering dog-like creature, which was leaning in to bite at his neck. At this point, Levi had suddenly emerged bearing a 20-gauge shotgun. He immediately opened fire, hitting the creature in the shoulder and causing it to drop his son. But as the weapon had only been loaded with birdshot, the attacker had shrugged off the injury seizing hold of Levi and killing him instantly. Terrified, Roger had run to the side door and fired his own weapon at the creature as it approached from the left. The beast fell onto its side and the youth took this opportunity to crawl underneath the vehicle and climb up into the framework alongside the drive shaft. Moments later, the camper van had buckled under the weight of something huge clambering inside it, and he had been horrified to hear the women screaming above him. Their cries of sheer terror had been cut brutally short, as they were dispatched with the same ruthless efficiency as the father and son. Roger couldn't be sure, but he had the distinct impression that there were in fact two of the creatures attacking the family. He remained below, finally hearing heavy footsteps retreating off into the woods. After waiting for what felt like an eternity in the eerie silence which followed, he rolled out from underneath the RV and ran to the main road in search of help. The driver of a passing pickup truck had listened intently to his story, taking him to a nearby farm and then calling for the authorities. When he took Roger back to the campsite a short time later, there were now several government officials and soldiers from the National Guard on the scene. Walking them through the events as best he could, the boy was struck by the lack of predation to the dead family members, the two female victims having had their necks broken as opposed to being bitten or feasted upon. The government agents had listened and nodded as he described how he had heard no growling or barking from the creatures during the attack, only heavy panting. He had further explained how the attackers, despite being canine in appearance, had moved like human beings. He had assumed they were men in dog suits, as opposed to any kind of animal. And yet, everything of value inside the trailer was still present, the officials found almost $20,000 sitting in the safe, these being the proceeds from the family's recent house sale. Roger would be taken directly to the airport in nearby Hopkinsville, where he was promptly placed on a flight back to his hometown of Cedar Rapids. Completely stunned by what he had seen, he did not speak of it to his family, but instead watched the news to see how the story would be related to the public. It never was, and it would not be until many years later 
when he stumbled across different versions of the incident circulating online, that he realised it must have been covered up. America's more remote regions are no stranger to reports of tall and aggressive cryptids, which are known to attack the unfortunate souls who cross their paths. But the majority of these have been ape-like in appearance, with a much smaller percentage being described by witnesses as canine. The beast from the land between the lakes is somewhat distinctive, in that it supposedly resembles an upright wolf, rather than possessing the hulking frame of the dogman, which is decidedly more humanoid. However, its behaviours appear far more human-like, with the creature reacting to technology with a greater degree of understanding than similar entities. This has led some to believe that the beast is possibly a skinwalker of Native American folklore. The commonalities in the stories of this creature and its various encounters with people make for an interesting case, but the fact remains that there is no proof to support its existence. Not to cast doubt on those who believe they have seen this entity and others like it, but until more compelling evidence comes forward, it will remain the stuff of legend. <laughs> 